Welcome to week two of our course. This week we're going to talk about political violence and we're going to connect it explicitly to modernity in the state. As you recall, last week we talked about modernity and what it is and what is the state, which is an important place for us to begin because that's the formula foundation of this whole course is to understand how states enact political violence against their citizens or others that are deemed internal or external others. So let's begin. So we have to define political violence. Last week we had a few examples and illustrations of it, but this week we're going to really delve into what is this concept that we're going to be dealing with throughout the course. At its root, politics is about power. The yielding of it, the wielding of it, the enacting of it upon others. So I'm going to read the definition because it really does merit being spoken out loud. Political violence is any act of violence motivated by a desire to influence or yield power. It could be committed by an individual, for example, terrorism, or by a group, for instance, war. In the example of a terrorist organization, it bears to mind that their purposes are by their very nature political. Terrorist organizations seek to impose maybe new forms of statehood, probably and most likely new visions of moral order upon the world around them. And so when they enact violence to achieve those aims. Now, we're still at a very broad level, so let's dig into this concept further. A negative definition will help us narrow it down a little bit as well. So I have a list of kinds of violent offenses and vi of acts of violence that are generally not motivated by a desire to yield or influence power. They're motivated by other kinds of desires. So in that case, we normally would not perceive these acts to be political violence. But I intentionally added rape to the list of violences on the previous slide because rape enacted by one individual upon another may be read as an individual act. However, in societies where women are commonly subjected to violence, and that violence is permeating throughout the society, so patriarchal societies, which arguably are most societies in the world, rape can become political in that it is one group of individuals yielding power over another with the often consent of the state. We will also later in the semester, in a few weeks actually, be talking about rape as an actual weapon of war, how it is actively enacted in warfare um, where parties are told to engage in rape in order to achieve certain political goals. So we can differentiate between rape individually, but it does bear to mind that in societies, like I said, where one group is subordinated, and is subject to another group's power. It is a political act. And certainly, as we have seen throughout history, rape and continue to see, rape and other forms of sexual assault are under monitored, under surveilled, under reported, and not acted upon in the same manner by states as other forms of violence which in effect leads to a situation where there's almost a, a, the state almost condones this act of violence against certain groups. So the reading that you read today, Schwarzmantel's uh, introductory chapter, defines violence, political violence, very cleanly and clearly. It is thus defined in a straightforward way as the use or threat of physical force to achieve political ends. And that's something that we're gonna remember, we're gonna keep circling back to, because this is our theoretical foundation for this course. We're not just looking at violence in and of itself, which is in, in and of itself an interesting study. We are interested in the way that violence is tied to political goals and we're focusing on states enacting it, which again, as we're now recognizing, states aren't the only actors that enact political violence, but this is the focus of our course because we did have to narrow it down to some way. Another theorist of political violence, Richard Kudo, 
identify certain elements of political violence. And we're going to be looking at these as we progress as well, in particular narrative capacity of violence. So we'll look at very structured theoretical frameworks for how political violence is enacted, how it is remembered and re-remembered in order to reshape the social order. So this definition right here captures that. And later in the semester, I'll be digging into this specific, the specifics of this kind of concept about violence. I also want to add, in case you're not familiar with the term eugenics, look it up. It is useful to understand the term for understanding the world in which we currently live and the forces that have shaped it. We're going to talk about what colonialism actually looked like for the people who are colonized. The next few slides have fairly graphic violent images and descriptions of all, many forms of violence, so I just wanted to warn you before we proceed. One of the most brutal recent colonial histories is that of the Belgian Congo, today the Democratic Republic of Congo, which from 1908 to 1960 was the colony of the Belgian state, but really actually almost a private colony of the Belgian king, King Leopold II. One of the main crops in the Belgian Congo was rubber which was grown in trees. I'm not quite familiar with the agricultural process, but rubber is an organic compound, and it was grown and harvested by the locals. The Belgian state, as enacted through its colonial monarchy, and specifically King Leopold II, was vastly enriched by the massive labor and extraction of rubber from rubber plantations in the Belgian Congo. One of the most violent and ferocious ways in which they enacted this extraction was that if people, individuals, families, communities, villages did not produce enough rubber, they cut off their hands. This image right here is literally an image of how the Belgian state enforced extraction of wealth from the Congo. Literally, they amputated the hands of workers, and here you can see this is a young person, probably a teenager, as a sign of both violence and dominance, but also to enforce the power of the state over the individuals, to enforce the power and to remind them that the Belgian military had the capacity to literally maim their bodies if they did not comply with the massive extraction of their labor. It was effectively a slave colony with such violence as, as a daily practice. In 1884, there was a conference of Western powers in Europe where the leaders of these countries decided to carve up Africa amongst themselves and colonize it. France and the British state, the British Empire, were among the most powerful, and so they claimed the greatest proportion of the continent for themselves. Germany, which at the time was Prussia, not yet Germany, was less powerful and therefore only got Southwest Africa, today known as Namibia. Some forms of colonization are purely extractive, like we talked about with King Leopold's Congo. Other forms of colonization are about settling. So Namibia today and then was what we call a settler colony. Canada is a settler colony. The United States is a settler colony. It is where a territory already housing people, because nowhere in the world were there not people before, is colonized and then people from the colonizing power settle the state, usually for agricultural purposes. Namibia, which is in southern Africa, near South Africa, the state, um, is agriculturally rich with, with rich, diverse farmland and growing conditions. So the German state sent its citizens to be farmers in Namibia. To do that, they had to chase off, um, remove from the land the people who were already there. The people in a large part of now Namibia were the over Herero, or also known as the Herero people. The German state 
needed to remove them in order to put its citizens down and then extract taxation and resources from the state. And they were unwilling to work for the state. So here is where Heinrich Göring, and you might recognize the name because this is the father of Hermann Göring, one of the architects of the Nazi party and state and one of the architects of the Holocaust. He mastered the art of the concentration camp. I do want to point out that he wasn't the, that the German state was not the first to do so. Actually, the British were the first to use concentration camps in Africa. But it was particularly violent because in the concentration camps, the death rate was exponential. If you take a look at this photo, and it is hard to look at, these people are near death. And they are near death explicitly through starvation and overwork. And that is purely because they refused to cede their territory, their lands, to a new power. When the Ovaherero resisted the colonial and military incursion onto their territory, the German state responded with acute violence. This quote is not just attributed, but is directly from General von Trotha, who led the armed response, and it is worth reading. I know enough of these African tribes. They are all alike insofar as they only yield to violence. My policy was, and still is, to perform this violence with blatant terrorism and even cruelty. I finished off the rebellious tribes with rivers of blood and rivers of money. That speaks for itself, doesn't it? And that's precisely what they did. He also argued that the entire nation should be annihilated or driven from their country. It's not often that we get to hear leaders, military leaders or political leaders so openly state the purpose of their violence and its, its scope. We do find that, we do find that in historical records, but generally speaking, it's usually more veiled under um, ostensible logic of civilizing, under other forms of language that are used to cover up the naked brutality that General von Trotha was not uh, opposed to speaking and writing. The German farmers who had settled on the land that was being cleared were part of this project and were very actively part of this project. They would poison wells, and water holes. They would literally hunt and shoot any over her whom they could find, sealing off their escapes. Literally, they hunted them down to eliminate them. This was not just a project of the state. The people of the state participated in it actively, violently, and in many in, uh, instances, as recorded, very enthusiastically. Lest we imagine that violence and brutality are the domain of only certain colonial powers, we should look at British colonial rule. The British state and British colonies enacted violence in a wide range of ways. And we're going to be looking at in this course the Canadian Indian residential school system, which is begun while Canada is still a British colony. And it is an outgrowth of the genocidal violence against the indigenous peoples of North America by those who came originally from the British Isles and then formed their own states here. So no state is exempt, no peoples are exempt from this. Where there is power, that power is often enacted through political violence. One horrific example is the 1876 to 1878 famine in India while India was under British rule purely to support another colonial conquest which was the second Anglo-Afghani -Af war in Afghanistan. The numbers are just shocking. 6.1 to 10.3 million people died of this famine and we barely speak of it. It is a footnote in history. 
Mind you, uh, we don't, won't be talking about Afghanistan too much, but we will be talking about it because it will be part of when we talk about wars and specifically Canada's participation in Afghanistan will be of interest to us. Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empires. And in fact, the second Anglo-Afghan war is not won by the British. It's the first colonial war that the British do not win. Afghanistan remains free afterwards. And within the next few, de few decades, actually, by 1914, the British Empire was vastly in decline and ended. So it's that's why it, first was the British Empire, then the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, fought an unsuccessful war in the late 80s in Afghanistan as well. And very shortly thereafter, the empire collapsed. And then, of course, as we know, the American Empire fought there too and has not actually won that war either. It continues to this day. So that's three empires that have seen the concluding moments of their imperial reign fighting against the Afghani people. Algeria was one of the French colonies on the African continent and the Algerian people rebelled. They fought back against French dominance of their state. So between 1954 and 1962 was an extended civil war within Algeria, the Algerian War. And it wasn't really a civil war because it was between Algerians and the French. This war was notable for a number of reasons. Firstly, the absolute brutality of the war, the way in which civilians were targeted, and the death toll. 1.5 million Algerians were killed. Another notable outcome of this war was that the French military devised new strategies of torture. And this excerpt up here, um, if you can read it, it's a little small, but I wanted to include the whole excerpt for you because it's important, describes how they mastered the art of using electrical shocks on very sensitive parts of the body like genitals in order to burn them in their attempts to torture or not attempts to great success of torture. This mode of torturing was then emulated in Latin America, was then emulated um, by the American military in a number of places. It became a playbook for how to torture really well. So my broad point here is less to dive us into horrific histories, though I think they ought to be remembered and spoken of, but primarily for us to recognize that the modern state form, though it is democratic, is rooted in violence and extreme violence. The 20th century, is often referred to as the bloodiest century of modernity. 60 million people were annihilated in the process of nation states creating themselves. And the projects of, as Hinton puts it, social engineering intent upon eliminating certain undesirables and contaminating elements of the population. Of course, the most common example that we use for this is the Holocaust of the Jews, where the German state actively chose to completely annihilate a whole ethnic and religious group. But that's not the only example. Hinton goes on to say some of the genocides of the 20th century we have knowledge of quite well known publicly, although not all. Um, However, the Herreros, the Armenians, Ukrainian peasants, gypsies, Bengalis, Burundi Hutus, the Aceh of Paraguay, Guatemalan Mayans, and the Ogoni of Nigeria are just a few other ethnic groups. And there are many, many more who were annihilated or attempted to be annihilated by the state that was attempt building itself upon their disappearance. I'd like you to follow the instructions here and take a look at the star 
deep investigative dive into torture. It's not easy to look at, it's not easy to read, but I think it's important. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say in the comments.